In this video, we're going to discuss the multimedia learning principles discussed by Richard Mayer, a cognitive psychologist out at uh, uh, University of California. And these principles can be used in your home modules when you're designing uh, uh, for a flipped classroom. And they've been proven to improve learning uh, in your uh, students. And so I thought the best way to demonstrate them was with an example. And so I pulled a slide off the internet that talks about the incidence of sepsis. Uh, and if this is your slide, I'm sorry, it's a wonderful slide. Uh, I'm just using it as an example. And so the first one that we'll talk about is the multimedia principle. And what that says is that uh, learners do better when there are spoken words and images rather than spoken words alone. So if I were to tell you that the incidence of sepsis is 95 cases per 100,000 in France, 95 cases per 100,000 in Australia, and 51 cases per 100,000 in the United Kingdom, you'd probably learn better if I showed you some pictures along with it as well. And pictures really means uh, words or images, anything that you look at. So having these words up here would improve your attention. The next principle is called the coherence principle. And what this says is that irrelevant images and text actually distract you from learning. So in this image here, there's a picture of the Earth, which really has nothing to do with the incidence of sepsis. And so it only serves as a distractor, so we remove it. Now we talk about relevant images. So in this one, I actually t replaced the image of the globe with one of the countries highlighted that we're talking about. So you can see here France, England, and um, Australia. The contig contiguity principle says that people learn better when words and images are next to each other rather than separated. Uh, and so they can be separated in either time or in space. So let's take again this slide and the words are off to the side and, and move them close to the countries that they're referring to. So now you can see the words are next to the countries that uh, they're describing. The signaling principle says that learners will do better when the key words are highlighted as opposed to not highlighted. And so we can do the same thing here in this slide by the key words here are the uh, epidemiology, the incidence. And so we'll highlight it by just making those words bigger. So now you can see the incidence of 51 cases per 100,000 is much larger and the, the details kind of fade, uh, fade more to the background. The redundancy principle is could basically be called the don't read your slides principle and what it says is that spoken words and written text with images uh, do worse than spoken words and images alone and so in this in this case you wouldn't want to be set you wouldn't want to say 51 cases per hundred thousand in england wales and northern ireland 95 cases per hundred thousand in 206 franchise use instead you would want to say something that wasn't just reading your slides. So you might say that the global incidence of sepsis is about the same in three different studies that were done across the world. One last one we'll talk about is the image principle. And what that says is that uh, my face adds nothing to learning. And so the all it does is serve as a distraction. And so you might you know put yourself on there as a narrator that's discussing what's on the slide but then the then the viewer has to look at your face then look back at the material then look at your face then look back at the material and it just serves as a distraction so get rid of your face so here are the principles uh, the multimedia principle says that add pictures people learn better the modality principle says that spoken words do better than written words redundancy don't read your slides contiguity says keep like things together Words and images should be next to each other in time and in space. The coherence principle says get rid of clip art and all irrelevant images and text. The signaling principle says to highlight your keywords. Image principle, don't put your face in there. And the segmenting principle, this is one that we didn't talk about, but what it says is that, use, that uh, um, learners do better when the material is presented in 
user paced segments rather than one continuous unit. This is also known as chunking. And this is what we'll see with YouTube videos that are 10 minutes in length as opposed to one long 60 minute lecture. If students didn't get that the concept in that one 10 minute video, they can go back and watch it again. And so they have the ability to control the pace. Personalization says that uh, formal speech does more poorly than conversational tones because formal speech has to be converted into something that you understand and then you have to go and, and understand the concept behind it too so it just adds more things to do robots voices do worse than human voices and finally if you introduce the names and, and key concepts ahead of time then uh, people are able to learn better so let's take a look now at, at a slide here and tell you know take a moment you can pause the video here if you want and Think about how you would improve this slide using the multimedia principles. So this is how I did it. And so I made a, a significant amount of changes. So first of all, you wouldn't read the text on your slide because you would be uh, violating the redundancy principle. Get rid of all the extra text and the images like this uh, character down here, this clip art man doesn't add anything to it. And even this thing, supine folk are sick. Yes, they are sick, but that doesn't tell you how to read a chest x-ray. And you're going to add pictures to the screen, add relevant pictures, like a picture of a chest x-ray. And actually, you can make the whole, actually fill up the whole screen and put the words, embed them into the picture so that it's next to what it's describing. That's the contiguity principle. And if you remove the extraneous words, as well by the coherence principle that's how I got this and so now the way I would have present this slide just reading the same thing that was on the original one would be in order to form a in order to uh, assess the adequacy of a chest deck so you want to look at a couple of things first look at the inspiratory effort you want to count about nine or ten posterior ribs penetration is measured by the thoracic intervertebral disc space it should just barely be visible and you want to assess positioning and rotation by looking at the medial clavicular heads. They should be equidistant to the spinous processes. Now let's look at some theory. Our goal here really is to create uh, instructional material that gets into the long-term memory of our learners and eventually is available for later use during performance in the real world. And of the four learning theories that exist, I think these fall best into the one of cognitivism. And cognitive scientists focus on human information processing, namely memory and thinking, to design their instruction, instructional materials. And there are three main concepts that we're going to focus on. This is dual channels, that is, people have separate information processing channels for visual materials and for verbal materials. Limited capacity... That is, people can pay attention only to a few pieces of information in each channel at a time. And active processing, that is, people understand presented material when they pay attention to it, when they uh, organize it into a mental model, and when they integrate it with, with stuff they, other stuff they already know. And so let's look at this cognitive model, and this is how Richard Mayer depicts it with this here. And let's, let's uh, walk through this. And so the world presents us with an infinite amount of data at any given moment. And our long-term memory has an expansive capacity for storage. The bottleneck here, however, is getting it through the short-term memory. So data comes to us through the world, from the world through our senses, our eyes, and our ears. And our sensor memory can hold information for just a few seconds. We select which information we want to pay attention to and bring that into our working memory where we can hold on to it a little bit longer. There, we make sense of that by organizing it into models, a verbal model or a visual model. And finally, we're going to integrate those two models together along with stuff that we already know, our prior knowledge, and use that to encode new knowledge in the form of long-term memory. Now let's look at those three, uh, th three aspects we looked, talked about before. So the dual channel theory. Now in most instruction, we don't utilize all of our senses but we focus mostly on visual and auditory. And all of our information is going to flow through those two channels, the visual and the verbal channel, throughout the processing of the information. And it's going to stay in that channel all the way up until the end. We see pictures, and we read the words on the slides, and it goes all the way through the visual channel. 
and we hear the words that they tell us, and that goes through our verbal channel. And it's not until the end that we integrate the two, along with prior information, into new knowledge. Now, both channels feed into working memory, which has a limited capacity. And this is what George Miller refers to in his 1956 article, The Magic Number 7, Plus or Minus 2, in which he demonstrated that people can hold only about seven pieces of information in short-term memory at one time. The truth is it's actually probably closer to four. Now, this limited capacity is why we cannot perform the multiplication of, of big numbers in our head, like 896 times 793 because we simply don't have the capacity to hold all the interim products and do the calculations in our head. Active processing is really three different uh, cognitive processes. So the working memory, in addition to storing information, has to do these things. Uh, it's responsible for selecting which sensory information we want to pay attention to, making sense of that information, by organizing it into models, and finally integrating it with stuff that we knew from before. All of this processing, plus those things that we had to remember, are all called together cognitive load. So now let's talk about how these multimedia principles help uh, with learning. So during instructional design, we can assist learners in each one of these three areas. So we have two channels, so we should use both channels in learning. This is where the multimedia and modality principles uh, come into play. So use pictures and words. We can also decrease cognitive load so we don't overtax the working memory and its limited capacity by limiting, limiting the amount of information that we put into the working memory. So don't read your slides. Uh, let students control the pace. Speak naturally so they don't have to translate formal speech into something they can understand. And avoid extraneous clip art. So we, we uh, don't put extra stuff into our working memory. And finally, we can also decrease cognitive load by making the processing activities easier. So by eliminating extraneous information and familiar familiarizing people with the important concepts ahead of time, we help them select what is important. By highlighting the key terms, we can help students organize material. Also, by keeping things that go together next to each other, we help with the organization. And finally, by presenting verbal and visual material together in a deliberate way, we can help with integration in these two models. And so that was a brief uh, summary of the multimedia learning principles. And if you apply these when you design your home modules, uh, you're going to have better retention and better learning outcomes for your students. Thank you very much.